So hi everyone, welcome to the Unhappy Hour. I'm the End Times editor Rachel Buzzle. And I'm the editor of Vet Times, James Westgate. Okay, so tonight we will be exploring the theme of finding your niche and specialising, or indeed, do you even need to? Um, we will be discussing this in discussing all of this with our wonderful panel guests. Indeed, we are. And once again, we've got so much to cover. We'll be kicking off with our main interview and in the hot seat this month, we're welcoming back Emma Gerrard. Emma has enjoyed a successful and varied career since qualifying as an RVN in 20, 2005, with highlights including becoming the first VN to hold an officer position for the BSAVA when she was elected as regional chairperson and council representative for the Cymru Wales region. Emma is now a specialist star theatre nurse at a not-for-profit community practice, as well as a Rama clinical coach, tutor for Encore, educational consultant for Central Veterinary Service, and editor of the BSAVA pocketbook for veterinary nurses, whilst also studying for an ISBPS nurses certificate in surgical nursing. I don't know how you find the time, to be honest. No, no. It's amazing. What an <laughs> intro. What an intro. <laughs> Okay, and straight after that, Emma will be joined by Jack Pye and Abby Edis on our expert panel. Uh, I think uh, for the incomparable Jack Pye needs little introduction. He's become quite the regular at Happy Hour, but uh, not only is he hosting another fantastic quiz tonight, which is bound to get those cogs turning and raise a few smiles, we're delighted to have him back on our panel. Jack is a local Marvian and is undertaking a certificate in ECC. His specialist interests are ultrasonography and ECC, and Jack is enthusiastically involved with BVNA Council, has recently started providing in-house CPD on ultrasonography, which is his nursing niche and um, we were discussing that before we came on and that's been an absolutely massive success um, he also enjoys supporting others in this area of diagnostic imaging that's incredible and we are also thrilled to welcome abby edis to the vn happy hour this month abby qualified as an rvn in 2010 and after three years she pursued her career with exotic medicine Abby has worked as, as an exotic species veterinary nurse at the RVC's Beaumont Sainsbury Hos Animal Hospital for more than eight years. And on a typical working day, Abby will be looking after exotic species inpatients, assisting with anesthesia and running nurse clinics, as well as teaching final year vet students and nursing students. And Abby has also lectured at both national and international conferences and enjoys clinical research in practice. And of course, we've also got stacks of prizes to give away this evening with £50 up for grabs in our ever popular picture challenge. Yep. Yeah, so tonight, what we're asking you to do is uh, to get that £50 voucher, we want you to show us how nursing looks for you. So show us a picture that sums up your role. And show us what it is to be a VN. You must have all pictures on your camera roll that illustrate your role perfectly. There must be loads of stuff on there, guys, to so send you in, send you send your pictures to happy hour at vbd.co.uk for your chance to win that 50 pound voucher you can do that now you can do that throughout the night but do it before the end of the night it's probably the easiest 50 quid you may ever win so uh, send those in to us yeah we're looking forward to seeing those and we will also be naming the winner of this month's pay it forward prize and announcing the two winners of the enormously popular top tips competition and on top of that, I mentioned earlier, Jack, the quiz wizard returns. So get your emails open or notepads ready. The person with the highest score will win an Amazon gift voucher. Yep. So all you have to do is send your answers to happy hour at bbd.co.uk before 8.15 p.m. for your chance to win. So um, before you get started, guys, please don't forget Happy Hour is all about you guys. Please engage in the direct chat, in the chat box. Feel free to message any of our panellists, message each other. Uh, if you're feeling shy, please feel free to direct message myself, Rachel Ebony or Remy. Um, we can post on your behalf or answer any questions for you, we hope. Yeah, and also get on social media, let people know you're here and share the hashtag VNHappyHour. OK, we've only got uh, 60 minutes, so let's get this power hour started. And um, welcome to Hot Seat, Emma. How's it going? Good, thank you. Good to be okay. here. Well, as per usual, and as last time you were on, we've had stacks of questions sent in. Um, so we'll get going with the first one. And that is, at what point did you develop an interest for specialising as a theatre nurse? And did you always want to do this? So I was thinking about this question and I think I had always wanted to be a theatre nurse. I think 
when I was a baby nurse and just starting out in mixed rural practice, there was a um, quite an old school vet that I worked with a lot. And it was sort of um, him, I think, that really gave me the idea about sort of specialising and, you know, really working towards being a theatre nurse. It was down to sort of boiling instruments. And I used to sit for hours and go through all the orthopaedic kit and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think I've always wanted to do it. And I knew very early on that I wanted to do the advanced diploma in surgical nursing. So, yeah. Fantastic. And, and how long has this area of specialism been, been, specialism been around and how many positions were out there? Certainly, I guess, when you were getting started and compare that to perhaps is how it might be now. So I think it's developed further. I think it's always been there, but particularly in referral hospitals, universities, that kind of thing. And I think more and more general practices are developing uh, nurses and obviously having the skills there to develop a niche. Um, I'm in quite a rural area, so I've not really been able to access unless I wanted to sort of move. Um, so really, I think within the last few years, it's mm -hmm. developed more and I've been able to you know, travel that little bit further and, and get that specialism that I wanted and sort of always dreamt of, really. And um, what is it you like most about the role of specialist staff theatre nurse? So I love being able to see those cases through. So from the moment that they come in, then we're doing our x-rays and working with our case, doing our measurements, obviously working in theatre, working with a team. So I work with another nurse and an orthopaedic vet on the whole, um, you know, and sort of working together and getting a fixation in place and then seeing a happy patient going out the door. And... Um... I mean, it's obviously a, a lot of things can happen. It's, it's quite a pressured environment in, in theatre and guess not, not for, for everybody. Um, but what have been some of the most challenging situations you faced in that particular job? It's a difficult one because I think the moment you don't think that something's challenging, I think there's a problem and then you could become challenged. So I think you should see every procedure as a challenge. Um, I think... There's been cases where perhaps a fixation hasn't quite gone well and you've got to go back um, or that moment where your oxygen's run out and you've got to get that changed. There's those high pressure moments. But as I say, I think every procedure is a challenge and I think you need to sort of remember that really. Hmm. Um, and what are some of the key assets or skills required for this niche of veterinary nursing? Is there a particular type of person? Are these skills you kind of acquire on the way or? I think all good nurses are adaptive, hardworking, um, keen to progress, um, you know, that kind of thing. So I think every nurse has a skill. Um, you know, to be a good nurse, you've got to have those skills, what I'm trying to say. So, yeah. Mm -hmm hardworking and methodical or organized um, so they're all the good skills that nurses have got to, to develop and what kind of CPD is available for this and, and what's involved in the ISVPS certificate in surgical nursing I should imagine that's quite an involved thing to undertake yeah so the course I'm doing at the moment it's eight modules so I chose the distance learning route um, which has actually been quite challenging because there's a lot of reading I chose that one because I didn't know the situation with COVID and how that would be um, there are face-to-face um, -face available as well so there's obviously those sort of certificates that you've got with improve um, you've also got your advanced nursing certificates there's plenty of course providers I have provided some links so they'll pop up in the chat box so you'll be able to find um, courses that suit you. Um, yes, there's a lot that you can sort of choose from at the moment. And I think it's progressing quite quickly as well. And um, how would you best advise I go down uh, finding a speciali specialism or, or narrowing it down? Because, I mean, you say that nurses are incredibly versatile people and, you know, they can turn their skill sets to most things. But... Um, I guess sometimes you could maybe be a bit bewildered by choice or, or maybe feel that for one reason or another, you're not in the right situation or you're not in the right practice. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't like the same things, do we? So I think it can take people a little bit of time to um, find what they like. I would say you don't always know what you like. I think it takes a good few years to develop and become quite an omnicompetent nurse. And I think then you're able to diversify and find what works for you and as you say not 
every practice is able, is able to offer those things. So I think don't be afraid to go out and look for it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, um, and, and is this the kind of role that you generally only see in a referral setting or is it is it a common role now, increasingly common in, in general practice, the yeah, theatre nurse role? Absolutely. Mm. So um, obviously being in theatre and, um, you know, it's a day to day occurrence for most of us. I'm not in a referral practice, so it is definitely becoming more common in general practice. So you won't just see it in referral and university sort of hospitals. So it's definitely developing. And I think there is space to develop your niche in a normal general practice if it's something that you want to do. I guess you've got to be quite confident. I mean, you said you knew pretty early in your career that this was what you wanted to do. So but you, you need to have those conversations with 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 your your managers, with the rest of the nursing team and obviously with the vets to make sure that happens. Because I, I guess if you've always had that burning design, you don't have the confidence or you need to find a way to to tell people that that's what you want to do, um, I guess. And that's not always easy. No, it's not. And I think we're going down the vet led approach, aren't we? So I think it's important to utilise all team members. As I say, we don't all like the same thing. So it's really empowering nurses to develop their skills. We get more satisfaction, um, you know, and then sort of signposting uh, other team members and clients to a specific nurse can be really valuable. And I mean, as you say, you, you, you're, you're an experienced vet nurse now. How does it, it make you feel, um, you know, to see all these, these nursing specialisms develop? And you, you mentioned the vet-led team, but we also, we, I've been doing quite a bit of work for Vet Times. Um, and a lot of the stories we, we are putting together now, we, we know that practices are stacked with work. And, you know, it, it's not something, it's not a nice to have, it's a have to have to make the most of your nursing team across all the specialisms that will come up tonight, but specifically with yours as well. I mean, it's absolutely key that the nurses are allowed and are pushed to, or, or push themselves indeed, to, to fill these niches to make sure that the whole thing works properly. Absolutely. You know, when you're freeing up events time as well, and also developing your skills, getting more uh, empowerment, enjoying your job, um, there's no point going to work and not enjoying your job. So I think, you know, we're highly professional skilled people and I think we need to be utilised a lot more. And I'm hoping in the future that will develop a lot more with protecting our title and hopefully advanced practitioner um, titles as well, which would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that's come up before. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a bit, but I mean, that is an absolutely key thing, isn't it? Getting that protection title and, and, and really seeing that all move forward. Yeah, absolutely. So I know BVNA are doing some amazing work. Yeah, they, indeed, yeah. Um, you know, and the RCVS and obviously BM Futures is really important as well. So hopefully we'll get there. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you will. Um, and uh, just finally, um, what's the best take home advice you could offer someone in, in taking this kind of specialism? or niche on and just just uh, I mean you, we, we talked about um, you know developing the role and you want to be able to progress your career I mean that's so important isn't it to be able to see mm -hmm. see it to be it and everything else and to be a real champion for this within the wider VN community uh, and, and to shout about it a little bit because people do want to develop their careers and it's not just the younger nurse it could be nurses at any stage of their career on here tonight who are thinking, you know, um, and, you know, I want to do something new, uh, you know, and what's what's the best advice you could give people at all stages of their careers who want to find their niche? I think work hard, be very patient. It's taken me 20 years to get to where I am. Um, and I think it all good things come to those that wait. So I think, you know, work really hard, um, keep up your CPD, really find that niche that you want to and really focus on it, work with your practices, work with your um, nursing colleagues. Um, you know, as I say, not everyone likes the same thing. So I think, you know, work with your practice to see what will work for you. Um, you know, put a plan in place to see if you can move forward. I think it's really important. And is it OK? Because uh, is it OK to, to sort of try a few things before you find? Is that common, you know, in your experience? You might try a few different niches. Maybe they don't suit. And that's fine, too, I guess, as well. Try a few things. Work out what it is you really, really like. Definitely. You know, it's 
it's a hard one, isn't it? I think, you know, you might, we can't be good at everything. So I think if something doesn't work, then try again. You know, it's not failing, is it? At least you've given it a go and you've experienced it. You've found what works for you uh, and what you enjoy as well. Fantastic. Well, that's absolutely lovely. Thanks for being so candid with us. And um, yeah, um, you're going to be coming back to join us uh, for our panel sh chat shortly. But um, just in the meantime, um, before we move into that panel chat, um, just a reminder to get your fingers busy, get those pictures sent in. Um, I'm sure we've had some through already, Rachel, but as you said, there's 50 quid up for grabs. Um, just to send us the picture that for you really sums up what it means, what it looks like to be a vet nurse in 2022 to you, the important things. I'm sure there's lots of lovely pictures coming in and we'll be announcing the winner of that competition later on this evening, about, probably about eight o'clock. Uh, depends how quickly we get through the questions, of course. Um, so um, next up, um, we're up for the uh, for the panel discussion um, where Emma will yeah. be rejoining us. Not that she ever went anywhere. <laughs> um, and uh, and Jack and Abby New, who's a deputy for us tonight as well. So welcome, Abby. Thanks for having me. And, uh, I believe you're kicking us off, Rach. I am indeed. Yep. So jumping right in, uh, the first question to you, Abby. So would you train to suit your practice or to what would suit you? Um, I think it's a really good question. And I think it very much depends on what you're happy doing. I think if you're newly qualified and as a nurse and just want to expand your like horizons a little bit more, there's no reason not to kind of train with your practice as to what they're doing. Um, like if they're doing more orthopedic work, for example, or if they're doing ophthalmology for that kind of thing, it, I think it's really interesting to pursue those things. And you can always almost have it as a tester to think, oh, do I like this kind of nursing? Mm -hmm. um, but then again, if you have a real strong need that you really want to go into, for example, I've gone into exotic nursing. If you re if that's really what you want to do, then there's nothing wrong with doing kind of your own thing on the side um, as long as it doesn't affect your actual job then I it really really depends from one person to another but personally as a nurse when I started training I didn't really know what I wanted to go into so I kind of just went along and did just did general practice but we had we had such an amazing case load in my first two practices that I kind of felt like I didn't find a niche but I found that I could expand my nursing knowledge just by doing some great GP work and it like yeah. it really made me a better nurse that way so I think it really depends what you want to do if you're not sure then try some different stuff if you've really got something you're set on something then go that way it's kind of up to you really fantastic thank you and Jack uh, next up question for you I don't have a niche um, how do I find one um, and how do you know the time is right to focus on this? Because you, you're a man with more than one niche anyway, so you're a good person to answer that, I think. <laughs> um, that sounds exactly like me um, when I was a student, actually, and also when I was newly qualified. Um, I remember being in practice, seeing people on social media and being like, they've all got their special interests, and I was like, but what's mine? And I didn't have one. And then started actually like putting pressure on it to try and find one and get myself worked up. And I was like, but I, I don't know what I like. I, I think I like a bit of anesthesia. I like my exotic, exotics. I've got them at home, but I don't know if like, you know, I ultimately really enjoy it as a niche area. Um, so yeah, I tried to force it and sort of look, sort of got into a trap of comparing myself to other people. And there isn't anything wrong with not having a niche. There's, you know, general sort of nurses in terms of be being a generalist and doing a bit of everything and enjoying everything we we need them in practice so it's great having a niche but also if you haven't got one it doesn't make you any less of a nurse at all um but yeah sort of finding it it literally just popped up one day i went to a cpd on on old sound and literally the rest is is, is history really um so and i if someone had told me two three four years ago that my niche area would be ultrasound I would have laughed in their face um because I usually used to sort of fall asleep in the room when someone was doing it so um yeah that's basically mine I'm, I'm sure you've never actually fallen asleep on the job Jack to be honest <laughs> but, so what you're saying is after really looking at 
forcing it too much to start with. But in the end, that niche found you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I do think it's an important point, you know, the, the general nurse, the general vet. I mean, there aren't enough, there isn't enough shouted about this, you know, this, um, you know, this om- omnicompetent role. Um, it's, um, it, it's a really, really good point. Um, and I, over to you, Rachel. Thanks, James. Yeah, I just, was just thinking I'm a, I'm a very big believer in what's meant for you will come to you. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that was great, Jack. I'm coming over to you, Emma. Um, what's the best way to go about a suggested change of role? Uh, should you draw up plans and include financials? And how do you demonstrate your niche? It's a really good question. So it goes back to working with your practice and your, your colleagues and your, your team um, to see what is available, what can sort of be utilised, I would say. Is there a vet that enjoys the same things as you? Can you set up clinics? Can you, um, you know, perhaps do some courses together to develop something a little bit more? I think it's really important to have a plan um, and go to your directors and practice managers and explain why it's going to work for you, why it's going to work for the practice, why it's going to improve your patient care. I think that's really important. Lovely, wonderful. And uh, Abby, this one's for you. Um, Have you got any advice for someone aspiring to work uh, with exotics? I mean, it's a subject we've covered uh, before on Happy Hour. And um, and what's a good starting point to develop knowledge? Have you got any recommended literature courses, groups? I'm sure there's lots out there. Yeah, so there's quite a lot out there. I think one of the main things I'd say before getting into exotic nursing is to be a really good GP nurse and it sounds really boring and it sounds like oh don't do exotic nursing but I think if you can tackle things especially things like anesthesia and critical care if you can tackle a difficult one of those then you will be absolutely fine with exotics because we find a lot of our patients are really sick they're often critically sick and a lot of them are doing anesthetics on when they're critically sick so if you can kind of stand doing a bit of GP nursing I'd say do that for a start but there are lots of societies and places you can go to for example we've got um, Association of Zoo and Exotic Nurses Um, they do a conference every year they their next one is actually I think it's next weekend Um, they are super and it's really friendly atmosphere really small conference and I definitely advise um, going to see those Um, British Veterinary um, Zoological Society is also really good um they also do a conference every year which you can go to and has like a nursing stream as well um i'd say do the city and guild certificate in exotic nursing i think it's called the advanced certificate now when i did it it was like the certificate in exotic nursing but they've changed it now um but i would definitely do that and you can split that into modules which is nice so you can do small mammal reptile avian wildlife and they've now got a zoo part to it as well um, and if you're interested, that's a really good place to get all of your baseline knowledge if you're going to go into exotic nursing. Um, I run some RVC CPD as well. We do that yearly and um, getting yourself some BSA VA manuals or just textbook in vet nursing. I'm a bit of a geek. I like to read textbooks. So um, doing nothing wrong with, with that. Abby. <laughs> do, yeah, doing work with wildlife, doing any kind of stuff. And I when I was in GP practice and getting into nursing, I would, I'm not necessarily saying do this because it was just over enthusiastic and don't tire yourself out, but I would stay behind. I, I very vividly remember staying over half an hour to an hour behind in my practice just to place an IV and put a goose on fluids because I knew it needed it. But I was like, I'm so interested in this. I know it will get better care if I stay behind. So advocate getting IVs in rabbits and guinea pigs and all that kind of stuff, just start building your knowledge and kind of building like little things that you can um, start implementing in your general practice like getting better protocols for rabbit anesthesia and that kind of stuff learning how to intubate that kind of thing is really important but I could go on for ages but <laughs> yeah no, well, I hope everyone was taking notes because there's some really good good yeah advice I think there's there. some links in the link box as <clears throat> well. right, yeah great I've yeah. just seen those pop up so thanks for that Abby. okay this one's for you Jack how do you develop your niche into something that you can do every day? And again, I think this is perfect for you because I think you've done exactly that, haven't you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Um, it's similar to what Emma touched on a little while ago as well and sort of um, benefit and sort of patient outcomes really in sort of speaking to your sort of practice directors about 
sort of your, your niche area and what you enjoy, how it will benefit the practice, how it will benefit the patients and ultimately as well, you as well as, as a nurse, because we spend the majority of our time at work. So we kind of need to make sure that we enjoy it. Um, so I sort of try and swing it how it's going to help. I mean, vets are so short staffed at the moment, as well as vet nurses in practice. So there's no better time for us to be using our skills. And specifically, if we've got that, that particular area, um, I know sort of in the ECC setting that my ultrasound was used like every single time I was at work, pretty much. Um, as I'm now locuming, it's sort of um, not as frequent. And I sort of get a, a nice feel for practices and sort of see how them different practices work and where the ultrasound can be potentially used in, in that instance. So, um, but ultimately it's all, it all comes down to improving patient outcomes is how I sort of manage to, to carve it into it each day almost. Um, and then I've kind of expanded that into sort of teaching and, and lecturing on, on that as well. So um, I do get a bit of it all, all the time sort of thing. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, next for you, Emma, um, I have a keen interest in, in medical nursing. Any tips on how to further my knowledge in the area as a new grad RVM? Yeah, absolutely. So as Jack and Abby have said, I think it's important to get knowledge as a new grad on everything. So make sure you're not just focusing on one thing. I think keep up your CPD, you know, reading your um, articles in your journals, getting medical mm -hmm. nursing books, I think are really useful. And I think also maybe start to think about developing a clinic, perhaps. So maybe start with diabetes, um, you know, focus on one thing and get really good at that. And then you can develop your skills further and move on to other sort of medical nursing um, niches, if you like. Okay. Right. This is a question for you all. So um, I'll read it out and then I, I'll come to you first, Abby, I think. So have any of you ever encountered any resistance from practice bosses or staff in developing your specialisms, um, cost of training or otherwise? So, yeah, we'll come to you first, Abby, for that. And, and I'll just add, feel free to name them if you like. Um... <laughs> Just for um, a bit of controversy. No, I'm, I'm not going to name. <laughs> no. Um, my, when I did my exotic certificate, I, thankfully my practice was really good despite being GP practice, um, but it did cost a lot less the back then when I did it. It feels like I'm really old, but I did it like, I don't know, I, I did about eight years ago now and it's gone up in price quite a lot. And I have had a little bit of resistance since to trying to do some certificates, but I think it's really hard. And I think as a nurse we want to expand our horizons and do more certificates but we're also not really paid very well and mm -hmm. I think this is a massive area that I think practices sometimes lose out on because if they don't give you a decent CPD budget or let you go on kind of certificates and things like that then we we're not going to be able to become special well we can but we we're not really allowed to be specialists but as in we can't expand our knowledge as well as we always want to and I think like I've got a mortgage and I've got my own bills to pay and I can't afford to do a certificate mm. unfortunately so and I'm being pessimistic but I think it's definitely an area that we need more grants and like help with to be honest mm, okay and Emma how about you yeah, I would agree with a lot of what Abby said. I've had to self-fund a lot of my further qualifications because I haven't necessarily had the support from the practices I've been at. However, with my niche, you always need a, a special, you know, a, a theatre nurse, I should say. Um, you know, it's a massive part of our day. So I think I've just been able to use my operating days to really develop. Um, get good at those complex um, anesthetics, um, that kind of thing, and and then sort of further my career that way. Okay, fantastic. And Jack, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I mean, personally, I've had some resistance from from some vets. It's, it's quite a mixture in terms of sort of people who I work with on the ultrasound front. Um, some people say, what's the point in you doing it? Because you can't diagnose anything. Um, surely if you're going to do an ultrasound, you're going to be diagnosing. I'm like, no, it's part of the diagnostic process. It's no different for us taking bloods, running them, taking x-rays. Um, you know, we're not necessarily interpreting them to, to form a diagnosis, but we can interpret them to um, change our sort of roadmap of how we're going to treat that patient and what we're going to do next. Um, and then sort of similar to what the, the other guys have said, sort of doing those skills effort sort of helps the practice. It's, it's great and helps the sort of patient care, but some certificates don't necessarily unlock 
things for us to be able to do in terms of extra skills or you know if I could do a certificate that enabled me to do sort of a centesis in an animal of um sort of free fluid in the abdomen a practice is potentially going to see more benefit to that than than sort of if I was to do a certificate that's get, gaining knowledge although you know my ECC certificate I've gained so much knowledge which is actually really really helpful when you go into sort of locum practice who might not have that knowledge there so it's just trying to get them to see the value in what is there so okay thank you I've got to say it's outrageous that there's not more funding available for that sort of stuff and we could do a whole happy hour on that VM pay rates as well maybe that's something we need to come oh, back to because uh, <laughs> um, well, we don't have the time tonight but thanks ever so much for sharing that with us guys but this is another one for you Jack um, do you enjoy working as a locum and how long have you how long had you been qualified before you went down that route uh, so I qualified in 2018 and started locuming at the start of this year I kind of fell into into locuming after um, taking a position that wasn't sort of as I expected it to be um I do really like it there's pros and cons to it so you've got your you know your cons of not having sort of self-funded uh, you know you have to self-fund any sort of CPD that I I want to do um, um but the pros are, of it are going around different practices seeing how they work you pick up new tips you get to teach new people and sort of em empower that and sh share your knowledge between it it's like a sort of big network um and there's also been quite a lot of appreciation from practices going in as well, because a lot of places are short staffed and, and going in to really sort of help that out and, and make a difference is, is quite nice. Um, but you do see a, a huge, vast sort of array of different sort of clinical standards, different equipment and what practices sort of do on, on their daily running. So it's, it's been eye opening and I'm extremely glad I, I have done it just to see how different practices work rather than being in my little hospital bubble that I was in in prior. So, yeah. Exactly. Okay, this one's for you, Abby. It's quite a, quite a good one. Um, should you feel bad if you don't know what you're interested in? Um, first of all, I'd say absolutely not. Like, mm. you don't have to be a specialist nurse. You don't have to have a niche or anything. And I think there is great merit to amazing GP vets and GP nurses out there. And I don't think people should feel bad for not being a specialist because I think it is often harder to turn your hand to other stuff in practice if you're mm. presented with... I don't know, a rabbit one day, a dog with a broken leg another. And I think it's just as good to be a, a GP practice. And just don't push yourself into a, a niche. If you don't, if you're not sure what you're doing, it might develop over time. I didn't know I was going to be an exotic nurse. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't matter. And just try not to worry about it. Just develop your skills as a nurse and it might come or it might not. But I think GP vets and nurses do not get enough merit for what they do. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more, Abby. Thank you. Um, question for you next, Emma. Um, have the number of niche opportunities increased in the past few years? And if so, what could this be down to? Do you think? And we've touched on some of the reasons, I think, in, in previous chats. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we have, haven't we? We have um, sort of touched on it a little bit. Um, yes, I think they are definitely increasing. Um, I think it's down to the huge skill level that nurses have and obviously practices wanting to hopefully develop those um, I think you know nurses have really been pushing um, to get those specialisms and and further um, job opportunities so yeah I've definitely noticed a huge rise over the years good to hear Rachel okay uh, Jack so specifically on ultrasonography uh, what's the most satisfying part of your role um, the most satisfying part of my role is seeing what difference I've made to a patient's outcome because um, you, you can see it if I've worked in places where people aren't co confident using ultrasound and I've sort of taught them to use it um, you know I, if they've gained knowledge from it the patients also had a sort of successful outcome so I can you know, it's one of them things that you can actually see the difference you've made so just an example we had a, a case of a dog that came in collapsed um free fluid in his abdomen and the vet hadn't learned ultrasound before so i sort of talked them through step by step of, of what we needed to do um and also with it sort of ecc knowledge and um they, they now sort of feel confident in carrying out a scan to see if there's free fluid and, and sort of doing a basic abdomen scan so um for me that's really rewarding to see someone go from not being able to do it to be unable to do it and it's benefiting 
not just that patient, it's benefiting all uh, the rest of the patients they're going to see in the future as well. Fantastic. Yeah, it must it must feel so good to see, like you said, you actually see that result. That's yeah. fantastic. And, and Abby, you mentioned the goose earlier, but um, <laughs> we've got a question here. Um, you must have a varied caseload. What have been some of the most satisfying cases for you to work on? Um, I think satisfying, similar to Jack, when we've definitely made a difference. I've also had some really like memorable cases. Um, for one that you might laugh about, we had a snapping turtle, which was um, about the size of two dinner plates brought in that was found on the River Thames. I don't know how the person who found it didn't have their fingers taken off but we rehabbed it and it's gone to a new home it was amazing that's kind of satisfying but the ones that are definitely really satisfying are we've had rabbits who have had anesthesia and actually had cardiac arrest and we've brought them back from like with CPR and they've walked out the door it makes it sound like it happens all the time it really doesn't I literally on one hand I can count the rabbits that we've had this but successful CPRs and um, kind of pushing the boundaries of treatment as well so I sent a couple of my own guinea pigs to radioactive iodine treatment and they've been quite satisfying because it's interesting and we're trying to like push things a bit more forwards um we had a rabbit with really congenital bupithalamus of its eyes so it had bulging eyes and it was really really aggressive pre-op and it was like just an awful rabbit to handle it was just <laughs> one of the worst rabbits ever and we did a bilateral nucleation on this rabbit and it was literally a different rabbit and it just shows you how much difference it can make to this animal's welfare because it was aggressive because it was in so much pain that actually we've made such a massive difference to his like life um and then sometimes like the really severe head tilt rabbits that do well um egg bound birds that we sometimes save um or even if an owner just makes the husbandry changes that they need to make um and the animal gets way better and you can see its welfare is like drastically better like a bird is on a better diet and having a better um time um another kind of memorable case i guess is we amputated a wing on a pelican from mm. st james's park that was super fun mm. she's still there and um she's called isla she belongs to the queen and she got attacked by a dog and she came in not long after like a few years after i started exotic nursing with an open fracture and we she was already pinioned so it was completely um not flighted so we just took the rest of the wing off and she one of the vets i think last summer saw her in st james's park and was like look she's here she's fine <laughs> and it's really nice to like know these animals are doing really well so i'm, I'm, ass I'm, ass I'm, I'm assuming liz didn't bring her in personally though <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, that's great. Thanks for sharing those with us, Abby. I love those. Some great stories there. Um, this is a question for you, Emma. Are there other areas of specialism or opportunities that can... Oh, sorry, I've just had my cat jump on the keyboard. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'll start that again. <laughs> Are there other areas of specialism or opportunities that you foresee coming sorry that's completely throwing me that you foresee coming the way of the VM profession in the future <laughs> I love your cat Rachel that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> oh he knows exactly what he's doing <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I think we touched on it again earlier on it would be amazing if we could get our advanced practitioner status um you know over some of the roles that we have in vet nursing so yeah I think there are plenty of opportunities I think just Keep being patient, keep working hard, and I think we'll get there. Fantastic. And um, uh, do you have any uh, good CPD? This is for all of you guys. Any good CPD provider recommendations for your field of specialisms without giving anyone any shameless plugs? Um, starting with you, Emma, then Jack, then Abby. Yeah, am I allowed to name companies? Yeah, um, you can. You yeah, can. as I'm doing the improved course, then yeah. I can. That would be yeah. one that I would, you know, it, it's been okay. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Um, you know, there's obviously the two options of distance learning and face-to-face. -face. Um, there's also um, obviously a lot of other um, colleges. If um, There's a link that I've shared or will share um, that um, will give you the information on the colleges that provide advanced vet nursing um, courses. So they're really useful. So they would be my, my two things. Jack? 
Um, shameless plug. Go on, go <laughs> on. You're um, going to say yourself, aren't you? <laughs> um, I, I do it in house CPD, which is specifically um, sort of for vet nurses and for the like veterinary teams, because I think by a vet nurse, we know sort of how that can be implemented and how it benefits us, the patient, and um, sort of the whole veterinary team as well. So obviously other imaging providers are available. Uh, <laughs> um, and I have got some other things coming um, in the near future, but I can't tell you what it is at the moment. Um, but there are, are some other bits coming. I personally done the Improve International um, Day, CPD Day, um, which is run by a vet called uh, David McKenzie. And um, that's what sparked my uh, in, interest in old sound from there. So yeah. well, keep us posted, Jack. Keep us Lovely. posted. And uh, finally, yourself, Abby. Um, oh, I think Lefebvre Vet online is great. These guys have some loads of um, like just resources you can go and find. Um, there's a vet I know who does justexotics.co.uk. She does some amazing like CPD. Um, shamelessly, I'll tell you, RVC does some CPD, which I do. Um, we run some small mammal and exotic ones i think i've got a lecture up at the moment that's just whenever you want to go um which is dental in rabbits guinea pigs chinchillas types of stuff and then just all your usual conferences i always go to all the exotic streams um and i guess i haven't done it a lot but i've got a um, facebook page called the guinea pig guru which is actually kind of really useful for anyone who just wants a bit more information about guinea pigs because i'm a bit of a guinea pig freak so i might expand that in the future it'd be really nice to i just have not had the time to but i might will do a bit more with that soon fantastic well um, yeah thanks ever so much for that it was really really interesting um, um it's just going to get even more interesting now because we've got jack doing his quiz for us so um um, we'll uh, just let Jack get himself ready, warming up. It's normally a very spectacular event, oh, this. No pressure then. No, there's, there's, there's no pressure. There it is. Over, over to you, from, from panellist effortlessly into the role of quiz master. Yeah, and just remember <coughs> um, to send your answers to happyhour at bbd.co.uk uh, before 8.15 tonight. Oh, um, so hopefully you can all see that on there. I always just check that the screen share is working. I'm sure it is, but if people can just nod if they can see the, the front page. Cool. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, we'll crack on. So I'll give you a bit of time for this one because there's um, four questions on, on the one page. So this is collective terms. Um, so you need to match the collective terms um, to the animal. So we've got uh, jellyfish, platypus, penguins, and stingray. So all quite random animals that you probably, well, Abby might have seen them in practice. I don't know if anyone else has seen them in practice. Feel free to pop them in the chat if you have done. Um, and the answers are fever, puddle, smack, and parcel. So see which ones you want to link them up to. And a little fun fact I found out whilst making the quiz that there are numerous terms used as collective nouns for penguins and it just depends on what they're doing at the time as to what their collective noun is so T typical penguins yeah. so fancy. <laughs> yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah i always thought platypus were quite rare so whether there'd be enough to have a collective noun. i just have to say i absolutely love penguins like i adore them i've done some penguin work and i love them but they just stink of fish <laughs> <laughs> I should I be going to feed them. them at London Zoo soon. So. Oh, they're great. We do the ones for the um the aquarium. Uh, yeah, we'll see how that is. Um, so yeah, moving on to question two. So hopefully everyone's had enough time. Well, not question two, it'll be question five. Um, which is warmer temperatures in environmental sex determination cause turtles and tortoises to be born male or female. This is one of mine that, that hatched as well. It's a photo I use quite often. It really looks like it's it, he or she is really bursting out from mm. in there, aren't they? It just makes me think of Freddie Mercury singing, I want to break free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if they're warmer temperatures, sort of for incubation, it's either male or female. Um, so pick which one. Battle of the sexes and all that. So, moving on to question six. So it's a, a riddle. So um, you buy a rabbit and it can mate once every month and give birth to seven babies per litter. How many rabbits do you have after 12 months? 
Spencer's going to I told you earlier, play. Jack, I can't do numbers. Oh. <laughs> this, this sort of reminds me of, um, I don't know if anyone's been watching the 1% Club on, on ITV1 on Saturdays. It's quite a good new little game show and it really, it gets you, gets you thinking for sure. Is it just, is this just as obvious as six times 12, uh, seven, even by my mouth is appalling. It's not, is it? It's, Who it's, knows? It's, it's a cunning riddle, Jack the Riddler. I'm not even going to bother putting an answer down for that one. Though. <laughs> don't, I don't know what seven times 12 is anyway. So. <laughs> huh? Right, so moving on. Another little riddle for you as well, as you clearly love the last one. Um, so it's, I'm not a donkey, but I carry a load. I'm not rich, but wherever I go, I leave silver behind. What animal, what animal am I? I can see people's thinking faces. I think I know this one. <laughs> uh, I'll have 20. <laughs> no, 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 you're not, but text me the oh. answer. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not a donkey, but I carry a load. I'm not rich, but wherever I go, I leave silver behind. What animal am I? Moving on to question eight is animals in the news. Um, so what baby animal did Dudley Zoo welcome the arrival of um, in the recent weeks? Um with it being the first at the zoo in its 85 year history. Is it elephant, jaguar, sloth, or orangutan? And before anyone says, I know that that's not any of the animals on the answer. Oh, I was gonna say as well, I felt really clever. But that's a is rhino, isn't it? A really cute baby rhino. It is lovely. <laughs> they are so sweet, aren't they? <laughs> you probably wouldn't want one, one, one tearing around your lounge though, No, you? no. Yeah, Imagine yeah. when it's tinsy tiny, I wouldn't mind, but yeah, not that big. Yeah. Do some damage, even without the horn, yeah. <laughs> so, elephant, jaguar, sloth, or orangutan? That's all answers. Moving on to question nine. Oh, we've gone too far. There you go. Uh, is animals in the news? A shark was found dead on the coast of Cornwall, and the result of death was concluded to be which of these diseases? Um, so, we've got leptospirosis, COVID-19, trigger warning there. Um, Legionella and meningitis. And what, what species of shark is that? A picture of Jack? Or? Um, that is the uh, great stuffed. Ah. <laughs> okay. Or, I mean, if anyone's got any other suggestions for it, then go for it. Yeah. So. I'll make a note. <laughs> cool. So we'll move on to question 10 is what year was ultrasound first used for medical purposes? So is it 1929, 1945, 1956, or 1962? I didn't know this until I searched it. I reckon it must have been after they invented I don't know, radar or something like that. Show my ignorance here, but I reckon it's post 45. Sorry to give the game away. I'm a genius. <laughs> it's probably completely wrong. So, moving on to question 11 is every reptile has scales? Is this true or false? You've struck lucky with the questions this, this time, Abby. <laughs> mm. So every reptile has scales, true or false. And panellists are allowed to enter the quiz, I'd just like to add. Can I enter it? No. Oh. <laughs> when, when I do a quiz, you can enter that, Joe. <laughs> but it's, it, that will be seriously low, low brow quiz. <clears throat> so question 12 is, what animals who is this? So koala, sloth, panda, or orangutan? Mm -hmm. Lovely image there for you, just for a Thursday evening. Everyone's had their dinner, right? Yeah, hopefully. It actually looks quite wholesome for Pooh, anyway. <laughs> I, mean, I, I haven't had my dinner, but I wouldn't be put off by that, to be honest. I'm sure people actually eat worse, you know. Oh, yeah, probably probably quite healthy. 
good roughage. There's no roughage fiber. there, isn't there? <laughs> a lot of a lot of fibre. Cool. Moving on to question thirteen is oh, so you two should know this really is <laughs> I, I, and, and I do. Oh, good. There we go. What year was the VN Times born? So we've got 1996, 1998, 2000 or 2002. This is when I show you the answers and I give you the wrong answer and you start bollocking me. <laughs> we only got, you only got in trouble when you use that picture of us all done up like the, uh, as, the as Harry Potter. Yeah. <laughs> And you had Lee yeah, outside Harry Potter. <laughs> and then Lee later that night sent me a picture of him when he was like 17 and he looks exactly <laughs> the same as you had him in that picture. It was uncanny. It was right? fairly close. It was. <laughs> Moving on to question 14 is, which animal did the word tyke originally refer, refer to? So when people used to refer to their, like refer to children now as being like little tykes and stuff like that. So we've got dog, cat, chimpanzee, or a goat. Some pointless knowledge for you that might come in handy one day. So we've got dog, cat, chimpanzee, or goat. And then we'll move on to question 15 is which anaesthetic drug used in veterinary practice is the chemical compound? I've been really mean. I haven't given anyone any answers, like multiple choice answers there. No, I mean, I'm out. <laughs> give you a clue, it's not any either that are on, on the syringes behind, just to make it even, even more difficult. <laughs> to be honest, that would be a quiz master own goal, if it were. <laughs> Or it could just be, uh, you know, it could be just tricking you as well. You could be, actually. Mm. I feel like I should probably give people a clue. Unless Does Emma, do you know it? Okay. Um, it's regularly, well, not regularly. I think we probably use it most in cats. In my experience. So... A couple more seconds. I don't know. Oh, there you go. So, an anthropomorphized mouse, a duck, and a dog, what do they all have in common? Does, do you know what anthropomorphized mean, or however you say that? Means, that, been, means that they've been humanized, or like sort of given legs and arms. I think that's what it means anyway, pretty sure. So that's question 16. And I believe the next question is a tiebreaker question. So, what exact date was general anesthesia first used? So this one is supposed to be extremely difficult um, because if there's any people who are on exactly the same answers, whoever is closest to this date, um, will win the quiz so that'll be the the date of the month the month and the year down to the letter we want this yeah <laughs> this, is, this this is massive emma's got this one in mm. the bag surely <laughs> well, she's she's not giving no anything pressure, away <laughs> she's not giving anything away no, not, not anything <laughs> Cool. And yeah, that's the last question. So, Well, that was absolutely brilliant, Jack, as ever. Oh, Fiendishly Jack. difficult. I think I've probably got three questions right. Does anyone um, need any questions repeating at all? Quickly. Oh, people are saying it's hard. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I always worry about making them too easy. Then everyone gets exactly the same answers. I think they're they're, they're pitched at that sort of the level we'd expect of oh. happy hour Jack to be fair. Yeah. I.e., that's the sort of level where Rachel and I probably get one or two. That's usually a good barometer. <laughs> if we get any more than that, then it's easy. Uh, really? <laughs> but no, thanks for that. Um, Brilliant. 
get your answers in. Um, over to you, Rachel, now, I think. I mean, yeah, over to you for the challenge. Yeah, yeah, we're going to go to the challenge winner now. We've had some lovely pictures in, just some wonderful, wonderful yeah, there we go, we've got some on the screen. Just um, you guys showing us what being a vet nurse means to you. And like I said, there's some wonderful pictures there. And I want to give me a drum roll and I'll announce the winner. <laughs> we need a drum roll button. <laughs> Okay, so our winner is, it's David Shorter. Thank you for sending in your picture, David. Um, we just thought, I think all of you can possibly relate to having that one patient or those patients that just come in and they really stick with you and, you know, just what you did for them. And I just thought that was a really lovely story. And I'm pretty sure you can all relate to having that patient patience it, it actually looks professionally taken that picture it's a beautiful um, picture technically isn't it? it's perhaps the highest standard challenge winner we've ever <laughs> had in 13 happy hours um, yeah, so, so congratulations so, yeah. david yeah well done david well done and um it's over to me now isn't it it is, to, it is um, indeed the the hotly anticipated and fiercely contested top tips section of the night we have loads in every month but we can only ever have one winner. Um, you got to give me a drum roll now, Rachel. Okay. And the okay. first of those <laughs> is a tip that came in from Amelia Sherwood, and that's to use polymem finger dressings as ready to go tail dressings to manage tricky tail wounds. So congratulations, Amelia. Um, I'm probably running too far ahead of you, Remy, on, uh, on getting these up, so I apologise. I do tend to go <laughs> off piste rather too often on these events. I'll probably get sacked. This is probably my last ever happy hour. Uh, you'll all be pleased to hear. And the other winner, as you can now see, is been sent in by Ellen Logan, Helen Logan, and that's use a stethoscope to listen to the speaker on a Doppler. Start with volume down low and slowly increase until pulse is audible. Great tip, great tips. And well done, guys. Um, you've got... Uh, 50 pounds, I think, unless I'm budget, busting the budget again. 50 pounds. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> Amazon Vouch is coming over to you. Um, and I always like doing the top tips. So we always get loads in. Um, I do, yeah. Great. And then, right, now we're on to our Pay It Forward winner. And this is the opportunity where you guys get to nominate a colleague for just a lovely little prize from us. We always send a feel good hamper out to the winner. Um, here are some of our entries up on the screen. And our winner this month was described as a ray of sunshine on our Thursday and Friday shifts. She works so hard and motivates, motivates others. And that is, and that's Amanda Ralph. And she was nominated by Kate Fox. So congratulations, Amanda. We will be putting together a lovely little hamper for you. And we hope it puts a smile on your face when you receive it. Congratulations. Fantastic. Well, that brings us to the end of the evening it just leaves me to say a massive happy hour thank you to abby emma and jack you've been absolutely fantastic thank you to ebony thank you to remy behind the scenes making all the technical stuff happen for us you've been amazing as per usual but um the biggest thanks are reserved for you delegates you guys who come and make this amazing um without you without you coming without your questions that you send in without your interaction on the night it is as nothing so please mm -hmm. give yourselves a huge pat on the back you guys are amazing um we were due to be back on june the 30th we may be we may not be we're keeping it a bit open because we've got a few massive happy hour plans up our sleeves but um we will be keeping everyone posted across the usual channels. So uh, thanks again. Thanks for joining us. It's been brilliant.